Turn to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And as you're turning, I want us to take just a moment to uh, pray for um, Mike Fuller, one of our men. men. Um, a lot of you know Mike and Martha. Um, Thursday night, they had to remove the front half of Mike's left foot over at Baptist Hospital. And then I was over with them last night. And this Tuesday morning, they're going to remove the leg up right below the knee. Um, just from complications. So that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big hit, you know, to have a doctor tell you that they need to take most of your leg off. So you be in prayer for Mike and Martha. Also, this coming weekend, I believe, is Memorial Day weekend. Uh, this couple of days ago was uh, Armed Forces Day. Um, tomorrow night... Um, in Joplin, Missouri, you know, Joplin a year ago had the tornado, and I forget how many folks were killed. Around 50 people were killed, and many more wounded, and the town devastated. Well, <clears throat> tomorrow night they're having kind of like the graduation service for this year's class, and uh, I found out through the Patriot Guard that um, the Westboro bunch from Kansas is going to be there to scream at the families that they thank God for their dead children and, and uh, loved ones because it was a judgment of God uh, that brought the tornado. So I'd like to also ask us to pray for the citizens of Joplin, Missouri, as they endure the, that kind of hatred from the Westboro Bunch. Um, and Mike Fuller uh, as well, Mike and Martha. So you all join with me in a, a word of prayer, and then we'll have our lesson. Father, we thank you for your love for us, and thank you for Mike and Martha. And We want to join together here this morning as a, a body of believers, a local church. And we lift Mike up to you and Martha. We thank you for Mike's faith and his uh, courage in facing this next uh, event in his life and their life and the testimony of his life but we just want to lift him up to you we call upon you Yahweh Rapha our healer you be with the medical team the surgeon all of the team and you guide them and we also just look forward to your presence there of grace and support and encouragement and we want to just join with um, our fellow citizens in Joplin, Missouri, who've endured such a calamity, a natural calamity, loss of life and destruction of, massive destruction of property. We thank you for their valiant efforts at rebuilding this entire year as a community, how they've come together and demonstrated the just the unique greatness of American citizenry, that when the chips are down, uh, they join hands. And as they endure uh, this intention from this group from out of state to come and to mock them and ridicule them and harass them, we just pray for um, your grace in their lives. And Lord, I'd like to pray for con conviction on the minds and hearts of the uh, Westboro folks who would do such a thing. We can't, we can't even imagine that kind of um, poison, that kind of hatred. And if there would be any way that you would bring uh, conviction and repentance to their hearts, to their souls and minds. We would certainly um, be thrilled to see that happen. So we pray for that whole situation tomorrow. Thank you, Father, for your word. And I just speak to our hearts as only you can do your spirit, to our spirit through your word here in the next few moments. For your name's sake, 
uh, for your kingdom's sake and for your will to be done here, even as in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> here in Luke chapter 15, oh, by the way, we had yesterday, we had the uh, kind of end of the year service for a school of worship arts. So a lot of you may not know, we started this a few years ago where we have different instructors like Mary with piano, Joel with guitar and voice, and Jennifer teaches voice, and uh, different students. It's a voluntary thing. They come and they want to be trained in the worship arts. So they had their program here yesterday morning, <clears throat> and I was just uh, really thrilled as a pastor to sit and watch that kind of thing happening, you know, where we have a concerted, pointed effort at training worship leaders. <clears throat> and like Joel said, sometimes God sends them out, amen? And sometimes they just serve right here. So we, we praise the God for our school of worship arts. <clears throat> here in Luke chapter 15, uh, this is a very familiar story. We usually call it the prodigal son. Uh, the title of the message today is um, um, Jersey Shore. How many of y'all have seen Jersey Shore? Y'all don't want to admit any of this stuff. Everybody's sitting on their hands, not me. How many of y'all know who Snooky is? Snooky's one of the stars on Jersey Shore. <clears throat> I hadn't seen it. Evidently, it's some kind of a reality show. Uh, for whatever reason, they chose some Italian young folks, uh, young adults, I guess following their life, following, and they must be what we would call party animals. Is that right? They party animals. I did hear the other day that Snooky's pregnant now, <clears throat> and um, has decided to give up the party life because she doesn't want her child to be like her. Amen. <laughs> How many here have that testimony? <laughs> when you. <laughs> well. Here in this story, the prodigal son, that's kind of like Jersey Shore. You know, they were, um, this young man, look, look at verse number 11. He also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the state I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country, <clears throat> excuse me, where he squandered his estate in foolish living. I love the King James there <clears throat> says riotous living. Squandered his estate. <clears throat> I don't know if you um, <clears throat> really un re realize what this younger son did when he said, Dad, I want my estate now. <clears throat> it's, it was his inheritance. Now, if you think about it for just a second, you'll, of course, realize that to receive an inheritance means the inheritor has to what? Die. So what this younger son did was, in reality, he looked at his dad and said, I wish you were dead. Right? Now that's pretty harsh, but that's exactly what he did. When I was younger, I used to, I, I just really couldn't imagine that kind of thing happening, you know, a, a, a child to look at their parents and say they wish they were dead. However, being a 60-year-old and having been around the block a couple of times, I no, longer, I no longer have a real problem believing that can happen. Um, now, that wouldn't happen at Cedar Heights, would it? I first really was uh, confronted full-blown, full face with this when we were in northeast Arkansas. I was a youth minister back in that day. And one of our men in our church contracted uh, cancer, and it was a very aggressive kind, and it was a moving kind that went through his body, ended up in his brain. It literally ate through his skull and was, I mean, had a big knot on the top of his head. It was just really tragic, and we prayed and prayed. Um, and nothing, nothing worked. Thank you, Mark. We prayed, and uh, our man, I'm not going to tell you the names, but he finally succumbed to the cancer and died. Well, it was a great husband and wife, and they had a son who was a senior in high school, so he was part of the youth group where I was 
the minister to. And so uh, a day or two after the funeral, I went over to their house and uh, visited with the wife for a few minutes. And, and I really wanted to visit to the son. He was kind of a troubled young man in a lot of ways. Uh, he was an in trouble young man a lot of times. Uh, he was in his bedroom, and so I asked his mother after visiting with her for a few minutes if she thought I could go visit with him. And I, you know, I thought I would kind of comfort him or, you know, minister to him. And so she said, sure, that'd be great. So I went to the bedroom and uh, knocked on the door and finally heard a little mumble, you know, what, or come in, something guttural, <laughs> whatever. I so I opened the door, and he was standing there looking out the window, with his back to me and just standing there looking out the window. So I thought, boy, you know, he's really in deep thought, um, grieving. And so I said a few words, and I said, you know, I've just come to talk, and maybe we could visit together for a few minutes. And he just kept looking out the window, kind of ignoring me, which was okay with me if that's what he needed to do, you know. And I said, well, I said, um, would it be okay if we had a prayer or do you have any questions or anything to say? And finally, finally he turned around and he looked at me and this is what he said. He looked at me and said, yeah, I want to know when do I get my old man's truck? And he wasn't joking. And that was the end of our conversation. I uh, didn't stay long after that, and I, I left. And that's kind of what this guy did. Oh, by the way, he's in federal penitentiary now. Got arrested a few years later in Memphis, somewhere around Memphis, running illegal weapons, drugs and weapons, selling stuff. Um, I don't know which federal pr prison he's in at this time. But that's what this young man said. I wish you were dead. It's kind of a harsh attitude. Uh, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4 so he could go live this riotous lifestyle. This lifestyle that's um, presented so much in our media, entertainment industry, and in so many levels as desirable. You know, the more you can get into, the more fun you can have, you know, the more successful you are kind of thing. It's, it permeates us probably a lot more deeply, more profoundly than we realize. I want us to look here at the first four verses of First Peter chapter 4. I just titled this little thing, Pagans. I get one goal of the message today is for us to see how pagan our culture really is in so many ways. Overtly pagan. All right, the first four verses of 1 Peter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same resolve because one who suffered in the flesh is finished with sin. Now, notice that Peter's presenting this as desirable. Okay. <laughs> Two, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent in doing the will of the pagans. Uh, the King James says Gentiles. It's kind of a generic term in the Greek, a generic word <clears throat> for somebody that's not a part of religious Israel just living like the world. That's paganism, living like the world. <clears throat> Doing the will of the pa uh, pagans, carrying on an unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, lawless ide idolatry. Uh, and, and then he goes on just kind of describing what so much of our culture wants to present to us as desirable. <laughs> the goal to have this kind of lifestyle. <clears throat> now the go to Romans chapter 128. Romans chapter 1 verse 28. 
We're going to read verse 26 through 28 of Romans 1. Romans 1, 26. This is kind of Jersey Shore stuff. Verse 26 of Romans 1. This is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. And I want you to notice those two words, God delivered. It's very significant. God delivered them over. This is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. For even their females exchanged natural sexual intercourse for what is unnatural. The males in the same way also left natural sexual intercourse with females and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty for their perversion. Verse 28. And because, because they did not think it worthwhile to have God in their knowledge, God delivered them over. Holman says, worthless mind. King James, reprobate. God delivered them over to a reprobate mind to do what's morally wrong, filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, wickedness, full of envy, murder, disputes, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful, and he goes on. I want to talk for just a minute about that word, the worthless mind, or if you will, the reprobate mind. That word reprobate, it really comes uh, from um, metal working, or types of metal, you know, like you build something out of metal. And it's a word that implies, or that's, that means that you have a metal with impurities in it. Um, mixed metal, it's metal that's inferior kind of metal, deficient, especially with impurities. Now I have here, don't get upset, don't be frightened, I'm not going to go postal. I have a sword, an old sword of ours here. And this old sword, I think it was, it's got some inscription on here, it was actually forged in the 1800s. Now as you look at this old sword, it's pretty, it, it's pretty, um, I would say this old sword's pretty deficient. It's uh, corroded, it's rusted up, it's dull, it's pitted, and everything. And I, I can pretty well assure you, if you were going into war, you would not want to use this sword against somebody with a really strong, vibrant, metaled sword. This sword, in many ways, pictures reprobation. It's just um, against a comparable foe, you wouldn't want to use this sword. This sword is reprobate, full of impurity and deficiency. I learned uh, about this one day, and I don't want to just tell a war story, but this kind of also illustrates it. Um, when I was in Vietnam, we went on a mission one day. It was kind of an urgent mission. I, I really can't remember all of what was involved in the mission. It was some kind of an extract. We had some troops in trouble, and we needed to fly out and get them out. I remember that. And I remember we always had to check out our machine gun. I, we had 50 caliber machine guns. And so we had to go to the armory. And we had a lot of political correctness even going on back in the Vietnam days. We, we had to check it in, check it out all the time. Went and got my machine gun, went to the helicopter, and, and lo and behold, now th this is just really strange. When I got to the helicopter and got to my station on the right side, there was another, there was a 50 caliber machine gun laying in the floorboard. Now, I never saw that happen. I don't know whose it was. We didn't, I sure didn't have time to worry about whose it was because, we, like I said, we had to get out on the mission. And so I just left it there, put it on, and we were out. And then, and I really don't re 
remember what all was going on, but I know I was shooting the machine gun, and then let me tell you what happened. Uh, in, a, in the 50 caliber machine gun, the bolt has a, the face of it has also extractor kind of claws, sort of, so that after the shell is shot, the bolt will be up against it, and those claws will go down on the flange of the spent shell and pull it out of the chamber, extract it, okay? They're the extractors. And then the next shell will go down, and then the bolt will shove the next shell into the chamber. Well, after, I don't remember, four or five or 20 shots, when the extractor tried to pull the spent shell out, it tore the flange off of the cartridge that was in the chamber. So the cartridge is left. It just ripped it off because there was deficiency in that cartridge. There was corrosion or something, and it tore the flanges off. And then the next round was slammed right into the spent cartridge in the chamber that was there, and I was in trouble. We, it's, it was jammed up. And I mean, it was jammed. It, there was no getting it out. Well, I had a 50 caliber weapon right at my feet. And so in about five seconds, uh, you know, I had them switched out and another, had another box ammo and we went to work. And like I said, I can't remember anything past that. But that 50 caliber round with that corroded, deficient material, it was reprobate metal. Okay? And in the heat of the moment, it failed. As a matter of fact, because of that incident, all 50 caliber ammunition all over Vietnam was inspected just because of that one incident. Let me tell you something. We live in a time and a day when you don't want a reprobate mind. You want your thoughts. You want the sword of the Lord, which is the Word of God. You don't want any humanistic thinking involved in your mind and your thinking. You don't want a humanistic philosophy. You don't want the, the ways of the world. You don't want any cultural influence in your head. We need to be filled with the pure Word of God. And God is, let me tell you what's going on. God is giving people over to reprobation, giving them up. And when God gives you over to something, let me assure you, only God can bring you back. We see this in our culture, a giving over to the reprobate mind. Now, for example, um, another example in the current debate today, like about health care and government health care. And this thing about using tax money to pay for contraceptions. You know, that's a pretty current thing going on. Um, and the, bless the Catholic Church's heart, they've, they've been standing there, haven't they? I mean, they've, they've taken the full brunt of this, um, I won't even call it a debate, of this assault on true religious freedom. And so they got a lady, uh, you know, to stand up and say that contraception should be a normal part of health care. It's about women's health for us to buy uh, health care, uh, contraception. And it was framed in a way that it really wasn't about preventing pregnancy. It was presented as though it was, a, you know, a, 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 I guess a disease that some women have in the uterus, a polycystic kind of thing, and that contraception helps that, and so therefore should be paid for. The only pro and, and it can help. The only problem is there are other ways to treat that same syndrome without using contraception. Did you know that? See, they didn't say that. They presented it as the only way. But I have this from a pharmacist and his wife, who has the very same syndrome, that she lied to Congress, perjured and overtly lied and misrepresented the truth. Um, that's going on in our culture today. 
overt misrepresentations and lies, reprobation, reprobate mind. And I'm going to have the exact information in the days ahead to share with you about the other uh, things. Oh, by the way, one of the other ways of treating this system would make a lady more fertile. <laughs> so that wouldn't fit very, very well with a lot of the crowd that wants free contraception. Okay. So, matter of fact, they would tell us that we're, we're filled with hate speech. Oh, there's a, there's a story today. A couple of ladies living together in Colorado that were openly, you know, involved sexually, living together. And uh, they had a dog, and the dog would go around and mess in everybody's yard. So the people, and they had a rule, you know, about dogs messing in yards. You should, if your dog messes in the yard, clean up the mess. Amen? Well, so the citizens, you know, their neighbors got tired of them not cleaning up the mess, and they complained. And so what the ladies did is it turns out they got a can of red spray paint. This is in the Denver area. And sprayed on their garage door, you know, God hates gays or something, you know, about hate, and turned it into the FBI that they were being threatened with hate speech. As it turns out, they did it themselves. They took the spray paint themselves and sprayed it on the door. So I'm wondering, are they going to charge them with hate speech for lying about their neighbors? This is a day that we live in. Turn to 1 Peter 4. It's being presented to us now, for example, that um, same-sex marriage should be a right. A right. If they can define it as a right, then it'll be a federal law to call it wrong. It'll be a federal offense to call it wrong. I think we don't need any reprobation in our minds, amen? We better, we better, have, a, we better have a clean, well-put-together sword, word of God, in our day. Now, this is what I call, we need to be anti-pagan, okay? Now, I don't mean the, against pagans, but in our own lives, Peter starts to address this, verses 7 through 11. 1 Peter 4. Now in the end, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-headed, okay? In other words, no reprobation, no impurities, no deficiencies in our thinking. Be clear-headed and disciplined for prayer. Above all, keep your love for one another at full strength, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Based on the gift they've received, everyone should use it to serve others as good managers of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be like the oracles of God. And he goes on. What, what is it to be anti-pagan? It's to be a practicing Christian. <laughs> a practicing, an active and involved Christian. Using the gifts of God for his glory and for the benefit of others. Now just, just a little passing comment here. We're almost through. As a child of God, if you are not using your God-given gifts actively for the profit of all and the glory of God, um, you need to change. If you're just living your life for your own whatever, your own benefit, pleasure, pursuit, desires, goals, if you're not actively involved in serving, you need to really think about your life. Okay? I'm not saying you're lost. I'm just saying that's not anti-pagan. Okay? Uh, first, look at verses 12 through 19. Still First Peter 4. Dear friends, when the fiery ordeal rises among you to test you, don't be surprised by it, as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, as you share in the sufferings of the Messiah, rejoice 
so that you may also rejoice with great joy at the revelation of his glory. If you're ridiculed for the name of Christ, you're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And he goes on, but you shouldn't suffer like a pagan. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Whenever a, a trial or a test comes my way, my automatic first response is, woo <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. How about you? My natural inclination is, you know, grumble. Or, oh, no, I can't believe this is happening to me. Amen? This is a discipline, okay? This is a discipline. And... Um, this is one of the only ways that I know to be anti-pagan is to realize, you know, I like to think of it this way. Life happens. Amen? Life happens. Uh, in closing, I just want to share with you one quick thought about how pagan, how reprobate the typical mind of the church in America is. I want you to listen to this real carefully. Um, every pagan nation in the history of humanity has one common characteristic. Every pagan nation in history, one common characteristic. And here's the common characteristic. When things go south for the nation, you know, hardship, struggles, famine, war, poverty, Floods, earthquakes, you know, when thing, whatever the natural event or human-induced event, when things go south for a nation, you know what every pagan nation does? They blame their leader. Listen. They blame their leader, and they say, well, this must all be because so-and-so's in charge, and if we got rid of so-and-so and got the right so-and-so in there, everything would be okay. And for however they do it, through revolution or whatever, they will extract the leader and put another leader in with the expectation this new leader is going to fix everything. You know what that is? That is pagan thinking. That's reprobate paganism. And do you know the church in America today is infested with that same pagan mentality? Oh, we got to get so and so out of office, and when we get the right person in office, then all of these problems will go away. And we can feel so self-righteous about pointing the finger. It's all their fault. It's all, the, it's all the federal courts. It's all the Congress's fault. It's all the White House's fault. And all we got to do is get them out of office and get the right man into office. And then everything's going to be jolly and roses. Amen? That is the ultimate paganism. That's the ultimate reprobate mind. You want to know what's wrong with America? It's called the church is what's wrong with America. We need to, we need to get the place like Daniel did. Like you can go read Daniel chapter 9. Okay? Go read Daniel chapter 9. They're in bondage. They're in open captivity in Babylon. They've been carried off. And Daniel in Je Daniel 9, he prays to God. And you know what he says? I'll paraphrase for you here. You can go check it out. Daniel says, you know what, God? We're here because we deserve to be here. We've sinned against you. And he goes, I mean, he draws out a long list of the offenses of Israel to God. And he says, God... For your name's sake. We deserve everything we've got and more. And then he appeals to God on God's behalf. You go read Daniel 9. You know what God needs in, the, in America today? 
He doesn't need a bunch of preachers running around pointing their finger at a politician or a bunch of politicians. He needs the church of Jesus Christ to fall on its face and say, God, we're corrupted. We're, we have impurity mingled into our thinking, our thoughts, and our lives. And we've had wrong focuses. God, we've, we, we've sinned against you. Let's bow for prayer. Now, I didn't say don't go vote. Amen? I'm saying we've got just what we deserve. And it's time the church acknowledged that. High time. It's past time. If you're here this morning and if you're caught up in if you're caught up in some sin, some as a Scripture would call a besetting sin. Ask yourself this question. Has God given me over to that? And let me repeat what I said earlier. If he's given you over to it, only he can deliver you from it. You can't do it. You're right. You see, we're not playing games here. We're not playing games. We're not playing church. We're dealing with life and death. And by the grace of God, we're going to have a clean sword, amen? A pure, undefiled sword, the Word of God. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. You are our Savior. You are our Deliverer. You're our everything. And Father, help us realize that today more than ever. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. You join with Joel. All things bright beautiful you are all things wise and wonderful you are in my darkest night you brighten up the skies a song will rise I will sing a song of hope sing a God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down, just to know that you and me is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. And all things new, I can start.
rope, sing along. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know that you near is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Oh, sing a song of hope, sing along. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Just to know you and me love is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven, come down. Amen. All right, well, let's pray and go and see you all back tonight. A lot of you I'll see at four, some of you I'll see at five, and then we'll see you all at six. Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that lives and dwells within your people. God, I pray that um, by the power of the Spirit and by the grace and mercy and the blood of Jesus, Lord, that you would wash us clean and renew our minds. And God, send us out with purpose to bring glory and honor 